see all the faces coming in. Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Good of you to join us today. Thank you. Hope everyone's happy and safe and well. Thanks so much for joining us. Just seeing all these lovely faces coming in. Thank you. We're looking forward to a really great discussion today and lots of your questions. I'm just going to pull the chat up. <coughs> there it is. Thanks so much for joining us. I think we're right. Two minutes past the hour. Hi, Rudolph. Nice of you to join us. Rudolph's in the chat. Anthony Smith. Anthony, the Anthony Smith I know. Hope you're well. Wayne McMillan, hello. Angelica, nice to see you. I met Angelica in, the, in Canberra a couple of weeks ago at the March for Justice. Good of you to join us. Thanks so much, everyone. Well, let's get started, shall we? Um, but again, thanks everyone for joining us and looking forward to chatting for the next hour and the chats there. Please keep your questions coming and we'll try to get to those. Let's begin. Good afternoon, my name is Denise Ravel. Welcome to our Spin Proof Live Zoom panel. We'll be presenting this panel once a month featuring various commentators and experts and thanks to Australia at Home for hosting us. I'd like to acknowledge the unceded Camaragal land I'm speaking with you from. Today we'll hear from a highly informed Auspol panel where each guest will share the issue which has been on their radar in yet another busy week and apologies on behalf of Emma Alberici, yeah. who was advertised to join us today. Uh, sadly, she's had a family emergency. She assures me that everything, everything and everyone is okay, uh, but she'll be joining us next month. So today we welcome Chris Wallace, Associate Professor at the University of Canberra and author of How to Win an Election. And thank you, Chris, for joining us at the last minute. Pleasure. Okay needing to get you involved. So thank you for responding to my quick phone call this morning saying help, um, but good of you to come. Adam Jacoby, uh, academic political commentator, speaker and founder of My Vote. Welcome to you, Adam. Hello everyone, lovely to be here. Thanks for having me, Denise. Ben Davison, Labor member, union member and co-host of the Week on Wednesday podcast. Uh, one of my favorite podcasts and I recommend it to everyone if you haven't already had a listen. A little bit of housekeeping, please share your views in the chat, add any questions to the question room, and we'll try to get to those in the next hour. Uh, some of the content today might raise some concerns for some of you, so we'll be adding support numbers into the chat. And thanks so much to Zareen and to Evan, of course, for keeping an eye on the chat. Um, and so thank you. First, let's get do a bit of a run around to each of our panelists and ask what's been particularly on their radar this week. Chris Wallace, again, thank you so much for joining us quite last minute. Pleasure. Um, I'm just continuing to be gripped by the extremely tactical handling by the Prime Minister of the ongoing gendered politics disaster uh, besetting the government. Uh, of course, the cabinet reshuffle. Uh, Amanda Stoker, ah, um, you're just wondering when it's going to end and it just keeps on going and going and going. Uh, it certainly does. Um, the cabinet reshuffle, I think, was interesting. I know, and I wrote down uh, Grace Tames, very nice, um, her description of the, ca the cabinet shuffle. Uh, or reshuffle rather, which I thought was rather apt. And I also note that Grace Tame joined Twitter this morning and very quickly achieved about nine to 10,000 followers in the space. Wow, good tip, must join, must follow. Yeah, must follow, absolutely <laughs> must follow. And good to see her in that environment where of course a lot of us are so politically interested and engaged. I thought that she said it quite well and I'm reading this out, I don't, my memory is mm. that good. Um, we need to be careful not to be naively misled by actions that are quite calculated distractions posing as solutions. Uh, mm. And I thought that that was quite accurate um, he's obviously elevated a lot of women to be seen to be doing the right thing, but will we see the substance that we need? And Chris, as you quite rightly pointed out, Amanda Stoker has some very concerning past actions, which would really put some question marks over 
um, over the role that she's taken on. That's true. And I mean, what's different about the current political situation is that Grace Tame exists, has a platform and is speaking up and out uh, about these things. And, and there are consequences. It's really quite difficult to see how Amanda Stoker can continue in her new role as assistant for women, uh, given the things Grace Tame says she has said and done. And of course, the Prime Minister is in a protracted uh, struggle with the press gallery, really, who are trying to create some accountability over issues exactly like this, uh, while the Prime Minister continues to handle things pretty much using his State Secretary brain uh, to tactically manoeuvre and manage rather than actually meet up with and address and solve the underlying issues. I think Scott Morrison's got some obvious moves he could make that I'm surprised he's not making. I think it would be very easy for him to declare himself the champion for quotas in the Liberal and National Party, uh, gender quotas, as opposed to gender, as opposed to quotas for women. Um, he's got a very plausible and reasonable case to argue if he wants to, which could make him look like he's doing something instead of just having another process, just having another announcement. Uh, it would be pretty cost-free for him in terms of actual impact because, of course, such a move would be grandfathered. It wouldn't exist, wouldn't affect sitting members. Um, but Morrison desperately needs something concrete and positive to do and get behind in relation to the gender issue. Uh, the cabinet reshuffle just did not crack the, you know, the problem for him. And it's, it's not going to. He keeps coming up with tactical non-solutions to an ongoing crisis. And, um, you know, when's he going to wake up and actually do something? Will some of the more hard right voices or people in his uh, party allow him to do quotas? I mean, as you know, even though um, Tim Smith at, is Victorian Liberal, of course, he's come out today and said quotas isn't the answer. Um, it just seems that, again, those structural issues, which we want to touch on a bit later, um, are, going to, are going to allow him to make those, as you said, relatively easy moves that he could be making. But Denise, that, that's, that's, part of that presumes that that's, in fact, the outcome. That's the goal for them. I, I think one of the critical things here is that they will move as far as they need to move until they think they've won enough votes from their safe areas to maintain power. They don't have any interest in actually changing anything. They just want to have the perception of changing enough so that they can maintain that the people in their, their key seats that they can count on will say, oh, look, they, you know, you know, look how many women are in cabinet now. That's good enough. That's good enough to keep my vote. You know, people were upset and he listened. I, I think, you know, we, we get, sometimes we get sucked into our own little eco chambers and I'm as guilty as anybody of this. Um, and, and people, there are a lot of people outraged, there's no question about that, and they have a, a right to be so. But at the same time, I think um, for the, the broader community that tends to vote for Scott Morrison, um, I, I don't think they're that interested, is the first thing. And, and I think that they are easily held and swayed by, just, by marketing gestures. Well, we know from the essential poll that came out a few days ago that what's going on is impacting on government support amongst women. Now, as... Uh, Catherine Murphy famously said in The Guardian, Scott Morrison is now pretty much exclusively addressing his rhetoric in public to men who might vote Labor. And the essential poll showed he's absolutely holding on to male Australians' votes, but his support amongst women, or the Liberal Party support, LNP support amongst women, is really significantly diving. Now, it becomes a very big problem for the government if all of these tactical moves don't stop a massive leakage of votes among women. And of course, it's not as though massive numbers of people are gonna change their votes over this issue. All it takes is enough moderate small L liberals who are female who typically vote for the LNP in enough seats for this knife edge government not to win next time. So this is a very big political problem. It's, we're seeing the acute phase of it now, the evidence of the chronic phase of the problem is evident when you look to the parliament's crossbenches and you see three female small L liberals who before the John Howard era would have sat easily in the liberal party room as moderate liberals who, who just can't have a, an existence in that party anymore and 
are getting elected and sitting on the cross benches. So Morrison's got an acute price crisis that he's not facing up to. He's got a chronic crisis that he's not facing up to. He's going to have to make a substantive move at some point. Otherwise, the leakage of, of votes and seats in that smaller Liberal space is going to prove fatal to Liberal and National parties. Uh, we'll see. Just a quick update. Bernadette Ryan, thank you in the chat, says that Grace Tame now has reached 16,000, 16, 16.2 thousand followers on Twitter. I mean, that's quite phenomenal in a single day, to say the least. Um, but Chris, absolutely agree. It seems Scotty from marketing, the headlines aren't sort of working so much anymore. People are looking for a bit more substance. And we've known anyone who's followed for a while knows that the substance is not there. Um, maybe maybe sort of the, the um, deck of cards is crumbling around him, but we will see. Um, I don't know if you wanted to mention Nikki Savage's article today in The Australian. Um, yes, well, of course, not many people and perhaps not present company accepted um, don't buy news limited papers on principle, but, you know, you've got to read the Oz because you've got to know what they're thinking so you know what you're up against. And, of course, Nikki Sava is just going through a golden period of, uh, of column writing. Last week's was blindingly excellent. Today's was fascinating. She's essentially arguing that even though things look bad for Morrison at the minute, the fact that he's not dealing with the situation means it's going to get worse. And Nikki, who's, of course, not only a fantastic journalist but a former Liberal staffer, is saying Morrison would be wise to have an early election to hold it this spring because it's only going to get worse and worse and worse for him from here. Really, really worth reading. Um, which, of course, there has been talk about the election later this year, but in the past weeks, that's really been pushed out to next year because of the, you know, because of the, um, you know, the events that have happened, um, the march and so on. So, yeah, really interesting perspective. Denise, can I just get in a little thought there? One of the reasons people come to that conclusion, analysing the current situation, is that they don't compare it to other possible scenarios, right? And this is what's why Nikki's analysis is good. She's not, she's not going, wow, things are bad now, he won't have an election. She's working out what the alternatives are. She's going, the alternatives are worse. And that's why an early election could well be on the cards. So we've got to make sure all of our analysis remains dynamic, not static, because static analysis can lead to some pretty bad and wrong conclusions. Yeah, that's exactly right. Ben. How are you? Ben yeah. Davidson, week on Wednesday. Thank you. Again, recommend the podcast if you don't already listen. Uh, your week, and I'm thinking that you've been keeping a fairly close eye on the Labor Party conference. So we'd like a little update on what's been going on there, but also, of course, anything else that's yeah. been on your radar. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, um, I think Chris's points are really um, fascinating when you look at the, the Labor Party uh, National Conference, which just took place this week as well because there's, there's quite an effort, clearly quite an effort by the Labor Party to try and break off votes from the, from the men. I saw someone in the chat go, how do we, how do we get the men to turn on Morrison as well? Um, and fundamentally, what, what seems to have happened at the Labor Party conference is a real focus on jobs, wages, job security, industry type policy, where do we go as a nation in the future? So people might remember, it seems like a long time ago now, but it would have only been Tuesday morning, the announcement of a $15 billion manufacturing um, commitment, should Labor win. That was a big part of their kind of introduction to the national conference. This, was a, this is a policy based on the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. So the, what's great about the Clean Energy Finance Corporation and why it's such a good model and I think why Labor wants to revisit it for manufacturing is that it has actually returned money back to the government. So since its inception, it's about 4.75% per annum. And of course, it's creating clean energy projects and creating jobs. So there's a real, there's a really interesting model there that I think they're keen to bring into manufacturing. Um, and we know that manufacturing, there's about 50,000 jobs lost so far in manufacturing due, during the pandemic. And of course, overwhelmingly in manufacturing, they are, they are male dominated industries. So there's a bit of, um, I think there's a bit of labor strategy there around, um, around men, but also those communities that rely on or have in the past relied on manufacturing. So that, that was a pretty big focus. And, and right through the first day, we saw a lot of stuff in the ALP conference debates and discussions 
um, around uh, manufacturing, jobs, recovery from the pandemic, what would it look like, how would it work? Um, uh, obviously, there's always a kind of interest in what will the points of conflict be? And this, this conference being a, um, a primarily digital conference, there's probably even more, um, I guess, backroom negotiation than in the past having been Chief of Staff of the ACTU and been to a number of ALP conferences in that capacity. Um, I'm familiar with, with some of that, um, uh, some of that work, uh, but I have to say this was probably the most, uh, uh, the most united ALP conference I've, I've ever seen. Um, having said that, there were of course debates and discussions around a couple of things. Trade is a big one. Um, and for anybody who's followed the union positions on trade, they'll know that there's been conflict between the unions and the party um, in the past, uh, and not so distant past actually. And again, there was some toing and froing around trade. And really, a lot of this hinges on the transparency around trade, the accountability around trade, the engagement. Uh, and I know from my own experience, the EU does this much, much better than we do in Australia, where there's a, a, a wide engagement with civil society. It's a very open process, um, whereas here it's the executive branch of the government. So essentially Scott Morrison decides, um, which you know leads to all kinds of perverse outcomes really, and special interests getting more than their share. Um, second day, people uh, might remember yesterday big announcement about electric vehicles and um, batteries so removing tariffs on electric vehicles under seventy seven thousand five hundred and sixty five dollars um, and exempting them from fbt the idea there of course is to try and lift the amount of fleet purchases uh, to increase the number of electric vehicles on the road and also um, provision of uh, about 200 million dollars to bring battery technology um, to 100,000 homes. So quite a, quite a green announcement there. And also it's, it's also come back to haunt Morrison a little bit. People might have seen today that uh, he was pulled up on the comments he made during the 2019 election about Bill Shorten wants to kill the weekend and electric cars won't tow your, um, someone's just shared it in the chat, thanks Evan. Um, electric vehicles won't tow your caravan and you won't be able to have a four wheel drive, which of course we all know is nonsense. You can actually get an electric ute if that's your desire, please go ahead and do so. Um, uh, and he's denied ever saying those things. And the great thing about modern technology is of course, as we are today, everything is recorded and you cannot, you cannot pretend you didn't say something that you did. Um, so that's, uh, that was a big thing. And of course, yesterday as well, um, the Labor Party had a discussion and conference around um, gas and um, the environment and energy policy. And I think it's really interesting, uh, the, the pressure that Labor comes under around, um, particularly around energy policy. And, and from my perspective, I really see it as, as two, or well, three distinct things. The, the first thing is um, around getting to net zero and there has to be a firm commitment to that and there has to be um, at least mark, markers on how we get to that point. Um, the second point is what does the transition look like for communities that are currently reliant on fossil fuel technology, whether that's in energy production, whether that's in high energy um, consuming um, industry like aluminium, uh, or whether that's in some other form of, of high emitting industry like, for example, um, agriculture. And then there's the third element, which is how do we manage the, the, daily, um, the daily energy needs in order to essentially reduce cost, make other elements of the supply chain more effective and create jobs and wealth that way. And gas is obviously one of those issues that comes up from a, from a how is this delaying getting to net zero, but also how is this impacting at the economic level as well. And so gas was a big part of the discussion at uh, ALP conference yesterday. Um, from my perspective, I always look at the gas issue as we're one of the world's largest exporters of gas. I think we're now the, the largest exporter of gas. Uh, we get very little in terms of tax revenue for that. So there's very little return that can be then used to create new technologies. It's not a highly regulated um, environment when it comes to exports. We, we compare that to other countries where they have domestic reserves for gas, they have domestic price fixing. 
we're actually at the point where despite being the world's largest exporter, we have uh, corporations wanting to import gas, such as the way the market has perverted um, that system. Uh, and we, of course, have corporations who want to frack and do all kinds of really awful things that, that most people in Australia actually would find quite reprehensible. So it was good to see that the Labor platform made some really clear statements about that, some clear statements about domestic reservations, some clear statements about how we go around transitioning out of that as well. Um, so, and fundamentally, from, from my perspective, um, and given my background, the, the elements around job security, um, same pay for same job for labour hire workers, uh, getting rid of rolling contracts. We're one of the few countries in the world where your employer can essentially put you on a 12 month contract or a 10 month contract. Um, and again and again and again and again. Um, so lots of good commitments there. Commitments around um, minimum wage, access to leave and superannuation for gig workers, which again, I think has some really positive um, potential. Uh, support for industrial manslaughter laws and also removing, I'm not sure how many people are aware of this, but at the moment, the Morrison government has essentially a blacklist of firms that are not allowed to get government uh, contracts where they have an EBA that provides certain things to workers. So if the government doesn't like what's in the EBA that you've struck with the unions on behalf of the workers, they can effectively remove you from getting um, government uh, work. And this is called the building code. Sounds like it's just about targeting the CFMEU, but if you talk to anyone in the AMWU or the AWU or any of the kind of supply chain unions, you'll find that actually it creeps down right into um, the, the base materials that go into a whole range of government projects. So Labor's committed to removing that. So it was quite a, quite a focused conference. I've, I've condensed two days into a few minutes there um, and, you know, really pushing the on your side slogan, which, you know, initially I thought was a bit naff. <laughs> uh, I've seen that hashtag doing the rounds as well. And yes, didn't, couldn't catch the conference in the way that I had in past years. So I really appreciate that update. A um, couple of comments in, in the chat, um, certainly also the Palestinian, recognising the Palestinian state. Um, so that's got a, a little bit of media, I think, over that. Uh, so another interesting move. And I have seen a little bit of pushback from some of the environmental groups about uh, Labor not going far enough on coal and gas, uh, but no doubt we'll be reading more about that in the coming days. But that's a really um, interesting update, Ben. Thank you, particularly for those of us that haven't been able to follow as much as we would. And let's hope that they can, you know, form these into good policy. But then for Labor, my, my, my view is that they need to get better at communicating this to voters. Yeah, and I think that's I think that's actually the key point, right? Is that the 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 platform this time is not significant. I mean, it's it's different to what it was last time, but the fundamentals of a lot of it are, are the same. And the platform is is about the guide rails for government, and kind of is about saying some things we will do, some things we won't do, and then broadly these are the guide rails for how we'll develop policy. Um, what's actually winning? What's important is, to a degree, you've got to win to do anything. And as you say, that comes down to communicating and, and, and engaging with people. So, yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that plays out over the next six months, or possibly shorter, if Nikki Sava's right. Possibly shorter. Um, as Chris says, watch this space also. And, yeah, certainly some interest in the chat over your comments about the blacklist. Uh, so maybe that's something that they can get onto. Thank you very much, Ben. That was really good. Um, Adam, coming to you. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, look, I've been on your radar this week. Yeah, I, I, I don't know. I tend to look at things slightly askew from others. I, I have the great luxury of not having a media job, so I don't have to be beholden to a boss or an editor. Um, and I have a particular perspective and slant, which is that of democracy. So I tend to look at everything that happens in a weekly Ospol cycle from a democratic perspective um, and try to get a sense of where we are. For me, you know, there was more of the the ongoing heady mix of incompetence, immorality and sociopathy that we see from our government and have seen for a decade. Um, but beyond that, I, I think there was a running theme over the last couple of weeks uh, that really stands out to me. So, um, be but before I tell you what the theme is, I was reminded, I went back and I watched a clip and I don't know how many of you remember this clip, 
but it was a clip of John McCain when he was running against Barack Obama. And he was at a town hall meeting. There were, I don't know, must've been about 10,000 people there. And a woman got up and started just spewing this misinformation, a lot of birtherism stuff about Obama. And McCain, um, with as much integrity as you would hope from any candidate, stood up and said, no, 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 that's not true. You know, let's be clear. He loves the country as much as I love the country. He just sees a different way forward. Um, and, and I just was reflecting that I cannot imagine anyone in our government having the integrity to do the same thing at this point of time and actually saying, no, 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 this isn't about left or right. Let's start with truth and then let's move from there. So for me, the ongoing theme, I'll run a few things. The first is the prime minister just refuses to get rid of Porter, Reynolds and Lammy. He wouldn't meet with Brittany Higgins. He runs away from hard questions in the media. Um, he only fronts friendly media. He wouldn't meet the throngs of people at the, the Women's March. Um, the countless number of, you know, we move that the member no longer be heard in parliament. For me, the ongoing theme in the last two weeks is cowardice. I, I think more than anything else, this government are a pack of cowards. They will not front criticism. They will not be held to account. They do not want scrutiny. They are not prepared to have conversations with their accusers because they rely on, and I saw one of the, the um, chat comments pop up just a few minutes ago, they rely on an entrenched centralized media environment. You know, we're the most centralized media environment in the world, most consolidated media um, environment in the Western world, save for Egypt and North Korea. Um, and, and so when you live in that environment and you have a bubble where you know that at the end of the day, the vast majority of the media is going to support you whether you tell the truth or not, you can just obfuscate and lie and run. Um, and, and that to me has been the running theme of the last couple of weeks that um, the prime minister will never hold himself to account on anything. Um, and sadly, he knows he can get away with it. Um, and, and I think, you know, to, to Chris's point, and I think she's 100% right, that, that there is a turning of the tide and there are people who are starting to wake up to a lot of this stuff now. Um, and I think, you know, to, to a point well made, Chris, it only takes a couple of seats and a couple of percent and all of a sudden this election goes the other way. But the bigger question for me out of this cowardice is actually that the cowardice really damages our democracy. And the reason it damages the democracy is because we can't have the questions and the conversations that really matter. Um, and, and for me, you know, one of the things I would have liked to see at the ALP uh, conference, and I have had private conversations with a number of federal Labor members about this, in the last couple of months um, is the need to address media reform. We need to address the media consolidation, so media ownership laws. We need to address truth in media laws. Uh, we need to address donations and the, the way they work in our parliamentary system. We need to talk about the standards that we hold politicians to when they come to us and make promises. Um, and so all of that stems from the cowardice for me because we, ha we have a group of people who are not prepared to front the conversations that really matter. Oh, thank you. And lots of agreement in the chat for you, Adam. Lots of here, here's in caps I've seen. Uh, so very well said. Some comments also about the rise of the independent uh, groups that are happening all over the country. Um, I think perhaps that's, you know, that to me reminds me of people are looking for a solution. They're looking for a solution. And part of that is in the independence. I'm wondering, um, Ben or Chris, do you have a quick comment? And we've also had a question on this on Australia's media monopoly. Let me come to you quickly, Chris, and see if you've got a, a quick comment on what we do about the media monopoly. I mean, it's one of those pillars that just is so hard to overcome and it does impact our democracy. We definitely need action on the incredible concentration of media ownership in Australia. That, that's a given. Absolutely, totally, 100% agree. I think the issue you come back to repeatedly, Denise, in, in your public analyses is especially an intriguing against the backdrop of what Ben's told us about Labor conference. And that's how well Labor's getting its message across. Ben, I was absolutely fascinated by that rundown. I only got time to watch a couple of hours of conference. Um, but I did radio this morning uh, with a, a, a capital city station and the announcer had picked up only a couple of things from conference. Mm. Top of mind was Palestine. Yeah. The other thing was electric vehicles. And that was about it. 
So, you know, yes, we need absolutely drastic reform to media laws, but even in the current context of appalling media concentration, how, if, how well is Labor really getting into grips with the basic craft of political communication? I know opposition is always hell. The media odds are massively stacked against the opposition, whoever it is. And of course, these days it's usually Labor. But given that, you know, is Labor really cracking the code on how to get messages through? Now, if Nikki Sav is right and there could be an election as early as September, October, and the main messages coming out of conference concern Palestine and EVs, that should be yeah. cause for concern of the Labor Party, right? Because what you said isn't... was a revelation to me. I mean, I think Adam and Ben, what do you reckon about Labor's communication skills? What do they need to do? Well, Ben, do you want to have a crack? <laughs> <laughs> Look, um, I, I mean, I agree with you, Chris. The, the, the issue with conference is always that it's a, it, it's a buffet menu of policy. Um, and, and you're going to have um, people with different barrows to push. I mean, even if you think about my, um, my rundown, it's pretty, it's, it is a bit skewed towards um, labour rights issues and workplace issues, because that's, that's my interest. But the broader point that you raise around uh, labour's communication strategy is the problem that it's had for some time. And, and I look at the success of labour in Victoria Queensland and WA as, as good models for federal labour. Um, and fundamentally, it boils down to talking about things that relate to people's actual lives and what they're experiencing and recognising that elections are about a decision point. Um, they're, not about, they're not about having people feel like you've dealt with every problem that they're going to face in the next three or four years. It's actually about getting people to a decision point around who they want to govern. Um, Labor federally wasn't very good at that in the last few elections. Um, I think getting slightly better, there's more of a focus on jobs, which frankly is a big part of the success for Victoria. You know, I live in, um, I live in Ballarat and in Ballarat at the state election, you know, we got an $834 million commitment to rebuild the hospital. Now, traditionally, Labor would talk about building the hospital and how many beds and how many patients and all of the, all of the good health things. Um, but what they actually focused on was it's 10,000 construction jobs, it's 8,000 jobs for health workers, it's another 2,000 nurses, and it's going to be, and, and it's going to be beds. Because nobody wakes up in the morning and says, oh, gee, I hope I have to go to hospital today. But they might wake up and go, gee, I'm glad I've got that job at the hospital. So yeah, take your point entirely. And hopefully it'll get sharper as it gets closer. <laughs> not much time, not much time. I have a slightly different perspective um, to Ben. Um, and usually I'm in the corner on my own, so I'm, I'm happy if that's <laughs> the case again. But um, look, I, I, I look at the way that, that Labor communicates. And in fact, shortly after the last election, I had a coffee with Bill Short and we were talking about this. Um, and I, I will tell you now what I said to him, which is what I still think now, a couple of years later, um, is that it actually didn't matter whether his policies were the right policies or not, because nobody was going to hear them anyway. And, and so one of the fundamental problems for me about Labor and where they sit at the moment um, is that when I look on social and see where they get the best cut through, predominantly it tends to be women in the Labor Party who are doing it. That's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is that it's usually when there is um, a bit of mongrel about it. And so, you know, to see Penny Wong actually calling out hypocrisy, to see Christina Keneally actually going after Dutton, that's what, that's what gives people a little bit of hope. And it doesn't mean that we're trying to create an entrenched tribalism, but I think ultimately what we've seen are a group of leaders who have shown... Um, a disinterest and a distaste for their constituency for the last decade. And what you want, what we want, what we should collectively be looking for, and I'm not suggesting this is Labor, this could well be independence, and personally, I only vote for independence, um, are people who are actually going to stand up for you. People who are prepared to go to bat and fight for you every day because you recognise that they care. Now, you're not going to win every policy issue, um, but what you'll win is people's hearts and minds, and that's what win votes. Um, and so from my perspective, one of the things I'd like to see uh, is a bit more mongrel. The other thing I've noticed on Twitter, and, and this is just a personal sort of experience, 
um, and I don't have the following of Denise or others, but you know, I've got a reasonable following um, and, and I'm reasonably well followed so that when I, when I put things out, it, it tends to get picked up reasonably well. Um, when I write about quite specific detailed granular issues about policy, I might find 50 to 150 likes or retweets. When I talk about going after the government or cowardice or things like that, I'll get 2,000 likes or retweets. P people are looking for the void of leadership to be filled. And I think Albo is a bloody nice guy, but I don't think he inspires the, I'm going to go to, you're going to war for me and I'm prepared to go to war with you kind of environment. Um, and I'm fearful for the ALP about that. And against the backdrop of your comments, Adam, uh, really interesting that the latest news poll, when you do net approval ratings, the Prime Minister's net approval rating is a positive 15 and the opposition leader's net approval rating is positive 2. And that's after five or six weeks of government in the biggest crisis yep. I can remember for 30, 40 years. I think it's interesting Polishing. too, Chris, isn't it? Because, it, you know, the point that you've raised about Nikki Sava's um, prediction, I think, plays into this too, right? So the the reality for a lot of incumbent governments has been the performance during COVID has resulted in high um, high approval ratings for the leader of the government. Um, obviously, uh, the poor performance of Trump cost him, um, but the perception that in the Northern Territory, Queensland, WA, the, the, the government had done well, meant huge personal approval for the leaders. Um, now, I think we're starting to see in at a federal level with JobKeeper coming off, with JobSeeker being cut, with more people stood down in aviation. Um, I think, you know, Nick, Nikki's point and the point that you raise is that actually the future for the Morrison government is going to be much more drag on that personal approval rating. Um, because as much as we, we are rightly outraged about the government's behaviour and its performance on the policy issues that impact women, that's been part of the Liberal Party's structure and DNA for some time. And, and people are generally in those kind of polls judging on what's going on now, what's happened in the last six months, how am I feeling about my position, generally speaking. Um, and, and a lot of people will now be coming off JobKeeper and JobSeeker, who for the last 12 months have probably felt more government support in their back pocket than maybe they ever have. So like, I, I agree with Adam um, as well, that if people don't feel like the government is on their side and they can't see the leader of the party on their side, then they're not gonna vote for it. You're not gonna vote for somebody to run the country who you don't think is gonna go into bat for you. Um, and there's all sorts of issues that compound that. Is that person honest? Does that person, resonate with me in, in other ways. And if those things don't come together as well, then there's absolutely no hope, right? Um, it's interesting to see Labor be so explicit to say, we're on your side. Like, as though, as though by saying it often enough, they hope that will cut through to people and people will take a second look at Albo. That's fundamentally what I think they're trying to do. I, I wonder also whether the concern over the vaccine rollout is going to hit. I think it's really interesting to see even some Liberal Premier or, you know, Gladys Berejiklian and Brad Hazard push back against the Liberal Federal Government and their vaccine rollout. I think that's a really interesting development. Yeah. We would, of course, expect to see it in Queensland and Stephen Miles today. Uh, the Queensland Health Minister, of course, came out and called again for the government to act on a national quarantine centre and actually labelled, I think, David Littleproud, the April Fool. Uh, some media today also, uh, Janine Parrott in Crikey, 848 aged care facilities have received the vaccine, but what the government doesn't talk about when they raise that is the 1,600 that have had no vaccine. Uh, Four million shots due yesterday. They were very vocal about that. I keep thinking also of the multiple press um, press opportunities and photo ops that Scotty had. He's not called Scotty from photo ops for nothing. Um, that were him in the white lab coat and saying very loudly that we would be at the front of the queue 
Um, clearly that hasn't occurred. And now, of course, there are significant questions about this. And all of that to happen with the backdrop of Michael, Michael McCormick being in media today, telling us to have a holiday on us. Um, it just seems quite extraordinary that why um, that while we've got some COVID hotspots coming up and clearly COVID again in the news, that they're out there trying to encourage us to take a holiday on us. It just seems <laughs> quite frankly ridiculous. Um, Look, the, the building picture is, you know, unarguably of a government that could not organise and run a chook raffle. But the question is, how do you get voters to change their vote at the next election compared to how they voted last election, which delivered an LNP government. And, you know, my question is always, what are the barriers to people crossing over? Now, to me, you know, the whole Albanese opposition, every, you know, everyone's tails up, conference has been good, the government's in trouble, you know, Labor's ahead in the polling, but by not much given mm. the degree and extent you know, very extended nature of the crisis engulfing the Morrison government. I mean, 48-52, Morrison will be arguing inside the government is a very good number, one that they can easily come back from during an election because, of course, once the election gets called, it's like a line's drawn. That was then, this is now. It'll be five weeks of vax picks of Scott. Um, you know, if, if Labor's current trajectory continues... It is hard to see how we won't see an Albanese rerun of the last two shortened election performances. 100%. Another narrow loss. Now, who's up for another narrow Labor loss? I think people concerned about incompetent government in Australia are very concerned that Labor might, in fact, do it again. Um, I, I find your comments, Adam, about you know a little bit of mongrel people really like and respond to. You know, I, I kind of think a similar thing, but I'd characterise it slightly differently. I think it's intensity. You know, that signal that someone really cares, that something really matters to them and they're really going to do something about, about it. And I'd point to Kevin Rudd's incredible success with the Murdoch Royal Commission kind of social media effort. Now, I, I hasten to say I am not for bringing back Kevin uh, into the Labor Party, let alone the leadership. But the way he manages to create media capital out of nothing again and again and again, basically through sheer intensity and force of will and relentless, you know, sharply focused rhetoric. You know, it's a skill and it's a skill that most Labor people on the front bench don't seem to have. And I think that's a problem that starts at the top. But Chris, can I put to you that it's not, I mean, yes, he's very good at it. Um, Kevin does a great job of that. But to me, it's that he, what, what Kevin is exceptionally good at, and it's why he got elected in the largest landslide in Australian political history, is he knows what people's hot buttons are. And so this is the bit that I find a bit astounding about the Labor Party at the moment, is that what we know is that the federal ICAC is an overwhelmingly supported idea. What we know is that media reform is an overwhelmingly supported idea. And what we know is that, po that political donation reform is an overwhelmingly supported idea. Why Albo would not be saying this, of course, we are for, you know, job security and workers' rights and all the things that the unions have been about and that Labor has been about forever. But let me tell you, if you elect us, the first three things we're going to do is we're going to change the media ownership laws, we're going to change the political donation laws, and we're going to have a federal ICAC inside 12 months. That it would be a landslide victory to them because finally people would say the things that you're not allowed to say. And I can't, and this is the bit strategically that I don't understand. In not taking on Murdoch publicly and clearly the way Rudd is doing, what the Labor Party does is entrench the system that it has to then fight because Murdoch will never be on Labor's side. Murdoch will always provide support and protection for the Liberal government. And so what it does in not standing up to him is just allow that to continue on. Well, as Bill found, standing up to Murdoch doesn't mean you defeat mm -hmm. and overcome Murdoch, particularly when it keeps you in opposition. So I'd make that caveat. The second thing is, I think that the three things you list overwhelmingly people who'd like a change of government would support. Those that understand the words that you use. Because, you know, the kind of voters Labor's got to win back to win are often low income, 
-hmm. welfare recipient, outer suburban, rural and regional you know, dwellers who would not have the faintest idea of what you just said, right? Lots of big words and arcane concepts. They're worried about, can they make their rent payment? Can they make their car payment? Can they afford shoes for their kids? I mean, I think there are different levels of politics operating here and Labor has to be extremely mindful. And I think some people are, Wayne Swan, the national president especially, that you've got to address the concerns of the mass of voters well. Otherwise, you do not have a hope of doing the three things you listed, Thank right? You. Can I just add to that, Chris? Because, I mean, I agree with you, Adam, 100% that those are three things that the country needs. Labor has committed to a federal ICAC. Um, they, have, they have a position around some media reform um, that's not particularly well articulated. Um, and, and I think um, when it comes to donation reform, they, they have a policy that's different to the Liberal Party. It's mm -hmm. not as as broad or as deep as a lot of people would like, but it is different to the Liberal Party. Um, and while people broadly support those issues, are they issues that change votes? Because Chris's point before, I think, is spot on. It's actually, to win government, it's about building coalitions of people who will change their vote. And, and those issues appeal to people who will either vote Labor, vote Progressive, in some way, shape or form, um, and are probably not going to vote for Morrison and Conservatives. Um, and and this is this is the, the fundamental problem, is that if we're, if we're talking about the policies that we like to talk about because we think they are important, and they are important, but they're not resonating with people who are fundamentally prepared to vote for one party or the other, like they, they're going to make their decision on the day. Um, I'm not sure what the current numbers are, but from, from memory, there was as many as 12% of people deciding in the line on election day who they would vote for. Um, those, those people need to be spoken to. I, I agree, Ben, but can I, put, can I put something to both of you? Because I, I, I vehemently disagree with both of you on this. <laughs> All of the three things that I put forward are non-partisan issues. So this idea that they are progressive issues, they're things that people on the left are interested in, in my opinion, is just a lack of narrative imagination. Because saying that we need political reform isn't a left and right issue. It's about saying it is unfair that you sitting at home, not having enough money to pay your rent, have to go through an environment where the political system allows people with more money than you to get better access to the policy outcomes that they want. That's not a left and right issue. That's a system issue. Talking about the way that we need media reform is because we have to make sure that the people hear the truth. And right now, we can't rely on the media to tell us the truth. That's not a left and right issue. That's a structural issue. And so it's about having the courage to have the hard conversation. And yes, it might not win the, you know, every person to come across and win in a landslide, but I think what people want is an even and fair playing field. And I think if you pick the right democratic erosions, and say these are important enough for us to bring them right up front in the conversation and explain to you why the system isn't fair and why you feel oppressed and why you feel like you don't have a chance and why you feel like you can't make ends meet. I think there is a huge opportunity to both do good and do well in an election. I think you can do that from government. I think doing it from opposition is virtually impossible. You've got during a federal election campaign of five weeks, you've got the opportunity as an opposition to communicate one or maybe two big ideas. And if you can do that, you've got to, and, and people like your ideas, you've got a shot at winning. I mean, we saw what happened with Shorten last time, a blizzard of policies, blah, you know, who knew what the message was? Still don't know, looking back. Um, so Robin Jewell, I think it is in your chat line, mentioned Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know, if you are living in Emerald, Queensland, you are not thinking media reform, right? You're thinking jobs, health, education. Okay. And th my problem with Labor is, you know, it's very close, like it's five minutes to midnight, possibly election wise. And I still do, know what, do not know what the big one or two message is from the Albanese opposition. I still do not have a clear idea of what difference it would make. Mm to change government. And that is a problem, not only for Labor, 
making it less likely to get elected. It's a problem for everyone because mm. it could well lead to another unnecessary, lamentable, incompetent LNP government getting elected, which is never stimulated by better labour performance to actually govern properly. You know, we need the LNP to be a lot better than it is. It's going to be in government sometimes, right? At the moment, I think it's in government too much. But labour through this kind of, you know, just motoring along performance is not stimulating what is necessary and that is better government. Labour needs to either win government and give us better government or, you know, compete hard enough to make the LNP perform better. But right now we've got the worst of both worlds. That's right. Ben, you wanted to make a point? Just very quickly um, on, on the, the point around how, how do we get these issues up when the media is sort of against, um, <laughs> against us in a way. Uh, I, I found out recently that Reddit has 600,000 Australians talking about politics on it. Um, uh, 600,000 Australians. Now, none of the major parties are actually on that forum or in that space. And, and it, does, uh, it does come down to organising, building communities. There's a lot of hard work that has to go on. And I, I take both Adam and Chris's point to a degree. Like, you want to do these things. You want to prosecute these issues. And yes, Kevin Rudd has a very um, good way of doing it. But there's also in the when you're in government, it's easier to do. When you're out of government, it's a lot, lot harder. Um, and finding these new avenues to engage people, I think, is absolutely crucial. I think that's why things like this forum are so important and spreading these sorts of forums out and getting this information out on different platforms. So, you know, I, I, would, I would really like to see a, a Labor government. I, I'm working towards one with a lot of people. Um, and it's for all the reasons we've talked about. Fundamentally, it's it's better for the country and it's better for outcomes for people. Um, I always say I sort of preface my criticism of Labor with the point that, yes, I would like them to form the next government for reasons that, you know, we all know and everyone probably listening to this um, or watching this also knows. We know what the Morrison government is like in terms of, you know, the in plain sight corruption every day, the policy platforms that are only entrenching things like poverty, um, and inequality. Uh, the Women's Economic Forum uh, report came out for 2021. This week, um, women have um, our position has dropped 26 places in terms of women's prosperity. I mean, that's disgusting. And it's all due to quite intentional policy settings by a government, which, as Chris said, has now been in power for far too long. Mm -hmm. um, I think that my fear is that, yes, Labor need to be um, better and I largely see them needing to be better in terms of their comms. Um, we've been going for nearly 55 minutes which is really goes quickly doesn't it? Um, so I should probably come to everyone just quickly for final observations. I'm sorry we didn't get it as much chance as we perhaps wanted to felt for some questions that have been coming through um, but ho uh, hopefully we can get the panel back again another time. So, Chris, let me come to you for a final observation before we finish up or a comment on, you know, what we've been talking about, whatever you would like to do. Well, tremendous discussion. And I'd just like to come back to Adam's, you know, list of three important things that need to be done. Um, you know, so totally agree. But there are conversations to be had in government where you've got the resources, the time, the energy to create and structure an idea, argue it through, bring people in. It's like, you know, slow cooking, getting big pol policy changes like that can be done from government, difficult, but can be done, virtually impossible from opposition. Very concerned that Labor is drifting to yet another unnecessary election loss. Gosh. <laughs> um, thank you, Chris. That'll keep me up tonight. Um, <laughs> um, Adam, let me come to you for a final observation. Oh, what a big conversation we've had, hey? Yeah, um, we, could go, we could go for longer. <laughs> we to take in on this hour. Um, look, I think my final observation is just that, um, that I hope as much as people are watching the ALP conference, the ALP, the people at the ALP conference are watching and listening to everybody else and what we're saying and what we're thinking um, and taking some new ideas on board, uh, as well as recognising, um, you know, as much of the conversation has centred on that... Um, going down the same road that they've gone down a few elections in a row now that didn't work is probably a good sign that it's not going to work again um, and that if they don't do something different, um, they should not expect a different result. 
Thank you. And just a quick Grace Tame Twitter update. Thank you, Bernadette, for keeping us updated in the chat. In the space that we have been talking over the hour, she now has 17,900 followers. So she's put on 1,700 followers while we've been talking. I mean, that's quite phenomenal. I'm so looking forward to seeing what she has to say on Twitter. Um, as you know, it can be a very robust um, and an informed conversation on Twitter. I'm really looking forward to what she has to add to that. Uh, ben, let me come to you for a final observation. Well, I just I want to thank everybody for the participation today. This has actually been a really uh, useful conversation from my perspective. And, and I think um, I, I take on board people's concerns. They say the definition of madness is doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. Um, my, my view is that we need to focus on those issues that are impacting people um, every day, narrow them down to as palatable and as easy to digest uh, message as possible and continue to reinforce that, reinforce that, reinforce that. But I would also say that it's really important that we actually organise ourselves as communities as well. And I know um, everybody who's involved with this is, is on board with that um, in one way or another. And I just want to give a quick shout out to the workers at McCormick's in Melbourne, uh, who are at the end of their fifth week of a strike. Uh, McCormick's provide, you, you might be familiar with their spices at home, but they also provide um, to KFC, McDonald's, um, Nando's, uh, and a whole range of massive multinational fast food corporations. And those workers have not had a pay rise in many, many years and have just voted down uh, another attempt to cut their conditions. So if you, do have a, if you do have a spare five or $10, I'm sure those workers who now have been without income for five weeks and are likely to be without income for some weeks to come would appreciate your solidarity. Um, so yeah, just a really great conversation. I'd urge everyone to, to, to keep up the struggle. Thank you, Ben. Appreciate it. And also, again, recommend Ben's podcast, uh, week, on, week on Wednesday. Uh, for those that don't know about it yet, it's really worthwhile catching it every Wednesday. And then he does a little weekend update as well, which is always good value. Um, a quick final observation from me. Um, yes, feel everyone's angst and frustration and feel like in some ways we're sort of flailing around looking for a solution. Um, after a lot of thought, it, you know, people who follow me know that I'm putting some time into the, these independent movements that are popping up all over the country and certainly in my seat of North Sydney, there's several groups forming. These uh, grassroots community focused groups, I think, are now in about 25 different electorates around the country. I think that's perhaps a sign of um, sort of a, a little path forward and perhaps a sign of hope that communities are really gathering together, talking about what real representation means to them, talking about the issues uh, that matter to them. So a sign forward there. Wanted to also give a quick call out to um, anyone who's still being impacted by the floods. Um, I am hope everything's sort of going okay for you there. I also listened to the 7am podcast this morning. Again, another podcast that I really recommend, um, talking about the mouse plague. So I was saying quickly to everyone before we came on air, it seems like it's, you know, fire, flood, pestilence and plague at the moment. So lots of challenges everywhere for sure. Um, also, anyone who was on JobKeeper, that's obviously stopped this week. So um, thoughts with those that are impacted by that. And, of course, Blues Fest pulled at the last minute uh, really, really quickly. Uh, I heard um, on a newscast this morning or a headline this morning that that area is, has been um, rely, is, has the highest reliance on JobKeeper in the country. So when we see that Blues Fest gets pulled like that, it obviously raises some concerns. So probably a range of final observations there from me, but just wanted to get that out there. Um, let me say thank you to everyone for joining us. It's been a really wonderful chat in the chat room that I've been glancing now and then. Um, but in the meantime, I'll say thank you to Chris Wallace for joining us, particularly at the last minute. Um, really, really great conversation. Thank you to Adam Jacoby. Good of you to join us today and to Ben Davis. A really terrific conversation. Apologies also on Emma Alberici's behalf. Um, and Emma has said that she'll be joining us next month. Um, I think the next Auspol Live panel will be on May the 14th. We're doing them once a month. Uh, next Friday, I'll be back on the live Spin Proof podcast. 
and some of our regulars, Cheryl Kerno and Nolly Neat, will be joining us. We might just go all afternoon with those two if anyone's listened, listened to the podcast that we generally do. But in the meantime, I'll also say thank you to Zareen and to Evan, who's been helping in the back end. Really appreciate it. And thanks, everyone, for a, for a wonderful discussion. Uh, see you all next time. And, of course, Happy Easter to everyone. Um, four days off, you who. <laughs> we'll do it. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.